Welcome to the Megatway podcast and YouTube channel. Hey, from Lenny, how are you? It's uh, been uh, quite a while, but I feel like I've been, you know, following you thanks to Twitter and uh, you are very prolific on Twitter. So, <laughs> but I learned a lot from you. So thank you for joining us today. It's great to be here, Makate. Um, you know, I was, looking, I was looking forward to this. I think it will be exciting. It's going to be a great conversation. So, you know, um, we shall see how it goes. <laughs> well, sure, it's going to be just great. Um, Fumlani, do you, can you, maybe, maybe we can start by you introducing yourself to our audience um, because it's, they can, they're going to read all the bio we put on you, but I always like people to hear from you who you are, what got you here. First of all, where are you based, all of that stuff. So please go ahead. Yes. So I'm based in Johannesburg uh, in South Africa. Um, that's where I am right now because of work. Um, so that's where my, basically my life is. Um, I'm from Guazulu Natal, which is the, the province in the East coast of South Africa. So that's where I'm from originally. That's where I grew up. And then life took me to a few places, places around the country, you know, studying at Rhodes University years back and then doing my, um, my, you know, continuing with my studies at University of Cape Town. Uh, and then, you know, and then I'm here in Jobbeck now. So that's where I'm based. And I'm mainly, you know, I'm more what I am focused on and, you know, uh, committing my, my labors to is basically, you know, looking at uh, public policy in South Africa, you know, being a commentator, being a writer, being a, a public voice. Um, I'm in the media, on TV, on radio locally. Um, I also, you know, get invited to conferences to talk about South Africa, the economy, the politics, where the country is headed, you know, the future, the history mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so that's one element of my life, you know. I I'm also a participant uh, or someone who is active in NGOs, you know, non-governmental -government institutions, uh, or, you know, non-profit -profit, profit organizations as well, where I sit on a few boards. Um, I, I used to sit on the board of the Free Market Foundation I now sit on the board of the South African Institute of Race Relations, uh, the RR, and these are all sort of very, I would say libertarian uh, think tanks, you know, think tanks that are advancing the values of human freedom. When you talk about markets, when you talk about small government, low taxes, you know, free trade. So these organizations, I'm also a participant in them affiliated with them because I'm, I'm, I'm more of a classical libra, you know, by values and by uh, ideology. You know, I see things um, from a classical liberal point of view. Uh, I, I strongly believe in maximum individual freedom. So that's the kind of work I do with them. And then I also work for a bank as well, where I'm mainly, basically I'm also involved when it comes to, um, you know, uh, a person who's involved in looking at the macro strategy in the bank, um, you know, being involved in um, in all the business strategy that that will, ad will that will advance our bank. So those are basically my my, my commitments where where I'm committed right now. It keeps me keeps me very busy. Um, at least it keeps me wiser. I learn a lot from it. Um, so that's where that's where I am. And uh, you know, um, I, I I am in this podcast on those basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. And um, so Fumlani, I'm always curious uh, when I uh, meet African people um, as to, were you always, were you always, um, did you always believe in the free markets or did you have, because for me, for example, I come very much from the left of the left in terms of my philosophies and how they got formed. And of course, eventually, as I started getting into real business, becoming an entrepreneur myself, uh, having a business both in Africa and in America, you know, in Senegal and in America, I started to see that things didn't really add up. And then, you know, then eventually I'm starting to understand that actually entrepreneurship doesn't happen in a vacuum. And it seems like the environment you get to inherit or not really does matter. So for me, I was not I was not always, when I was using my mind, I was not always, you know, a free marketeer. I started, it's, it's, it's once I started experiencing things 
and looking at different at how different my my experience as an entrepreneur in Senegal in West Africa was compared to being an entrepreneur in America. But I started to be like, wait a second. So and of course, as I started looking into it, it started to make sense, right? This this business environment, the business climate. Um, for you, were you already there from day one? And if so, you know, how did it happen? But if not, like what what was your what was your your you know the travels of your of your mind on these? Yeah, well, well, when I was a young star, and by young star I mean when I was in, in school. Um, well, I, I had uh, I had not found myself right. Uh, this means I was less than eighteen years old, so I had not really. I wasn't thinking ideologically, you know, whether um, do we see our society as the one that should be sort of pro-market or more socialist status, status kind of a society. I was not like that. And, you know, I think there's no young person in high school who's less than, less than 18 who thinks from that perspective. Right. So, but I mean, naturally, we tend to be more of Marxist, you know, as young people, because we think these That's works. That's why I'm first. asking you. That's why yeah, I'm asking yeah. you, because most of exactly. us Africans, yeah, we <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so for, for me, it was exactly that as well. Um, though I was not radical, but I, I thought that there is a significant role that government can play, you know, yeah. in the economy as a young person, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought like that even in my undergraduate studies, right? When I was studying at Rhodes University, uh, I remember in my first year, I joined a student's organization that is very much far left in South Africa, right? It's popular and it's far left in, in, in university campuses. So I was part of that, of that, um, you know, of that group of students. That was my first year. But then I never continued, continued in the second year because, you know, the, the radicalism in it, um, intolerance in, the, in that group. Um, I just, I couldn't know that I thought about it. I thought about it that this is not really good for me from an ideological point of view. It never got there, but it was just, I, could, I just couldn't feel it, you know. What, 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 I couldn't feel this what, militancy. Fumlani, yeah. what was it when you say this radicalism, um, this, ex what was it? Give us, give some examples, like, you know, like what examples, what did it look like that radicalism? I mean, what it was well, it about? Well, <laughs> well, the songs that were being sang, it's the struggle songs. You would show a thing that you would show a thing that is the songs that date back to the the days of the apartheid system, right? The struggle songs, you know. We are still oppressed. Um, you know, we want this, we want that. So there was a kind of mentality, and also arguments and divisions even in the meetings. So the whole culture of the the, the organization, I just I could not feel it as a young person. I, I could not affiliate by nature, right? Um, everything was a struggle. Um, we are victims of some system. Um, and therefore we need to do something about it. So for me, that it, it didn't really gel with me. I couldn't feel it. And then, um, and then, you know, in my second year, I could not continue. I just let me choose to do other things, right? So I progressed and then I got to UCT. Uh, I remember I had a friend, uh, I used to, UCT. yeah, University of Cape Town. Yeah. So when I got there, I was, I was, I was not staying in residence. I was staying somewhere in a suburb. With a friend of mine who was um, who was and still is um, an economist, right, and a researcher, and he was reading a book about Milton Friedman. Uh, you know, we was just, uh, and then he showed me a passage and said, "Can you come read here?" The book, Milton Friedman's book, is the, the popular one uh, called Capitalism and Freedom, right? right. Yeah. So he 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 showed me a passage then. Then I read that passage and I was like, "Who is this guy?" You know. And then said, yeah, no, it's Milton Friedman. And I went to Google this. I watched the YouTube videos. I remember I used to watch the free to choose uh, Milton Friedman's program. I used to see that and I would watch his lectures as well. I was like, this person speaks common sense. You know, I like what this person is saying. What did you like? Is what right. was it? What did you like? What was, well, what was the common sense? Yeah, well, it was the idea that, you know, individual freedom is critical, right? That we are best as individuals um, in making decisions about ourselves, right? That we have a right to choose, we should have right to choose um, in the market, right? As to what we buy and what do we sell. So that resonated with me. Um, and the idea that, you know, if government takes control or is heavily involved, involved in the economy, you will therefore have faced many inefficiencies in the market. You are going to experience, you know, um, the huge costs from a taxpayer perspective because for government to exist alone, 
it needs to be financed by taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. So now you shift all the money that people have worked hard for and you give it to government, uh, you know, political politicians to make decisions about the money. Therefore, you're not going to find efficiencies there. Um, and the best way, you know, to reduce inefficiencies and the potential for corruption, rather remove the government and let, and let people who know what's best in the market to trade and sell. And that, that resonated with me. And I liked Milton Friedman a lot. He's the one actually, I got into the free market thinking because of Milton, um, Milton Friedman's work and book, Capitalism and Freedom. Um, so that changed for me. And I was already at my fourth year at, um, at UCT, mm. at University of Cape Town. And I realized, you know, I mean, this is the path. And ever since I've never changed, I've never looked back. Um, the, 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 my faith and my belief and my experience in life and what I've, what I've seen and read, um, you know, has been sort of, um, uh, you know, reinforced over time um, about these ideas, the idea of maximum individual freedom. And by the way, and then I began to learn as well that it's not about economics. It's not about economics. It's about the, the, the right as a human being to make decisions about yourself, about anything, right? To have that, that choice about your life. It's, 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 it's not an economic issue, Magadji. It's not an economic issue. It's an individual right as a person to make decisions about your life, whether it's in the market, whether it's personally, um, you know, in the world. So for me, that's how I have transformed. And um, I think over time, and I was, I remember in, in, even when I was at, at Rhodes University in, in my undergraduate years, I, I had an idea that because there are some parties in South Africa that advocate for very much Marxist Leninist way of thinking when it comes to public policy. And I remember at the point, you know, these guys, I was thinking, these guys, they may have a point that we need to nationalize, that government must take over some companies, right? Some sectors be taken over by government. I was thinking these people, they may be speaking sense. But then as soon as I, there was a revelation um, through uh, Milton Friedman's work, then I began to realize actually I was on the wrong track and I've never changed. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, I'm always so and, and, and you know, and, and I'm so happy that it happened when I was young. You know, by the time I was I was 23, I was already a free marketeer. <laughs> you know, I'm happy with that as well because at least wow. my adult life, that's how I've been thinking. Some people they can find this very late yeah. and they've just been, you know, because it can take you off track in, yeah. in many ways in your life. Yeah. Wow, wow. No, it's, it's always fascinates me. It, it, this is a fascinating story. It always fascinates me to know how um, any of us Africans, especially being in Africa, um, you know, you can just um, allow your mind to, to travel from one, one place to another and just kind of be able to, look, to take a look at it as you did and make your own, you know, compare and make your own conclusions. I, I, I find it fascinating. And, I, and to me, it calls for a lot of... Um, it shows me a lot of your intellectual uh, integrity because it's not easy to stand up for what you stand up for um, nowadays on the content. It's, it's, it's becoming easier, but still not the popular, the popular way to think. So Fumnani, thanks so much for sharing that with us. I think it's always good to know. Mm -hmm. So I invited you today because I really, really wanted you to talk to us about Nelson Mandela. I mean, I know that following you on Twitter, and I, I would ask everybody to follow you on there, and we'll make sure to put your information on the, you know, down below yeah. in the information section. But um, it's just so nice to have someone like you, who's very uh, intellectually alert and so sophisticated, you know, just kind of basically um, feeding the rest of us all the way from South Africa directly. So that's so I would encourage everyone, everyone to do that, and. Um, because personally, for me, I've been learning a lot from you, you know, um, from your tweets. And I remember this one spat we had. It was not really a big spat, but OK. So for me, I, I have been telling folks for the longest time, yeah, 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 I love Nelson Mandela. I mean, come on, you know, when he passed away, I, I turned all the lights in my room. I laid on my bed and I was basically just I was this morning, basically, you know, and there with his death went um, one of my greatest um, goals in life and uh, aspirations in life, which was to meet him in person and be in the same room 
of, and the same air he was breathing because that's, that's how big this man was to me. Yet mm. at the same time, I had big issues with him, but I, it took me a while to come up with, it took me a while to start talking about my issues with, the, about the part of Nelson Mandela that I was not so enamored with. And it had to be with um, his um, Marxist views, right? And so I came to the point where, because I didn't understand what you're gonna share with us today, um, I thought that, um, because when you look at South Africa today and where it is, I took it for granted that of course, South Africa is where it is today, uh, economically speaking, because Nelson Mandela was a very misguided Marxist to start with. And so my whole, I always thought that maybe he came in and uh, he just somehow found a way to bring back his Marxist views into policies. And um, you shared with me on those tweets something very um, interesting. I'm not going to, you know, tell people because you're going to have to tell us again with much more information. So... So there goes this Nelson Mandela figure. Um, his outlook uh, was very much influenced by Marxism. And we know that uh, the African uh, National Congress was made up primarily of Marxists. However, by the time he took office as president of South Africa, it seems like um, his idealism had faded or changed or who knows. So I guess my question for you was, as a South African living in South Africa today, um, and also who someone who has spent so much time on these issues and understand them probably better than anyone else I can think of. Um, what do you think is the economic um, legacy of Nelson Mandela, um, of his presidency? And um, do you think that South Africa would look any different today if it was another prominent person who had um, taken his role back in the days instead of him? So maybe let's start with that question and just see um, what you would say, because I'm, 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 I'm very intrigued by that. It's a question I often ask myself. Yeah, well, you are not alone, uh, Makate. Um, the, the, the narrative um, that has been around for a while, um, uh, especially amongst us, classical liberals, for you and I, classical liberals, less libertarians, um, there have been many of us who have been battling with this. People have been saying, well, Mandela was a Marxist. You know, yes, may have done great things for his people in South Africa, embarked on reconciliation, you know, to forgive and all that, but he was a Marxist, a Marxist, a Marxist. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you look at it, yes, that is, okay. In my, what I have read and in my understanding is that yes, during the time of the, the struggle against the apartheid in South Africa, against the apartheid system in South Africa, the, the, the black leaders, right, who were fighting the apartheid system, um, uh, fighting for a democratic South Africa, they were largely Marxist, no doubt about that, right? Um, dating back to the early 19, you know, 40s and so on, um, even before the apartheid sort of struggle started, there was that um, the revolutionaries in South Africa, the black people who fight against the apartheid system, they were very much largely Marxist. And Mandela was part of that group, no doubt, during the fight against the apartheid system. And in fact, by, well, what has been found was that by the early 1960s, when he was imprisoned, um, at the time there was the speculation that um, some intelligence, you know, agencies, uh, both in the West and South Africa, uh, from the apartheid government were saying that this guy is the member of the South African Communist Party. Um, uh, which was basically a threat to the, the apartheid government at the time. Um, not because it was just fighting apartheid, but also because it was seen as affiliated to uh, the Soviet Union, right? And the Soviet Union at the time was advancing communism throughout the whole globe. And part of the process in the Soviet Union involved, you know, going around funding all these groups that can, you know, that are aligned to its ideology. And there has been that, but throughout, throughout the years, the decades, Mandela denied that he was part of the Communist Party. He really denied it. He pushed back, no, I'm not, I'm not, I've never been a member of the Communist Party. I've never served on it. Um, up until around 2000, I think a decade ago or so, um, about, about 15 years ago, something like that, 15, 10 years ago, 
uh, apparently there is some um, intelligence that came out that actually there was some confirmation confirmations that were done that he was the member of the of the of the communist party um he south African communist party but he was yes that he was he was yes okay. that what that, that's what um you know was found okay that is fine but now let's talk about um the economics of how things sort of played out when mandela did he implement marxism in south africa when he came in or not we understand that there are this sort of there's this perspective um or the findings that he was a communist that he was the member of the south african communist party as as early as just before he went to prison in early 1960s but let's look at the economics of this so he he's released in 1990 after 27 years in prison right um you know there's excitement in the country there is a jubilation you know new times are coming black people will have will be on the table now to determine the cause of the future. It's time for the negotiation process and so on and so on. You know, that would lead to the founding of a, a democratic South Africa. Now, when Mandela was released in 1990, no doubt that the conversations in the NC, um, which is the main party, that basically the leader of the liberation groups in South Africa, uh, because there were other organizations that were pushing back against the apartheid system, but the NC, the African National Congress, was the main one, right on the lead, right. And um, so, when what was discussed in the NC in the meetings um, at the time before 1994, between the release of Nelson Mandela and before the democracy came in 1994, um, there was much discussion about okay, we want to. In fact, this was. In fact, after he was released, uh, after he was released in 1990, the discussion was basically about we are going to nationalize, you know, key industries in South Africa. We are going to take the Marxist route to socialism. That was the narrative in the party. That was the that was the, the the goal and the objective. That this is how we are going to rule when we take over the country as the NC. We are going to nationalize things. We are going to transform the economy in a Marxist way, more regulations and so on. So that was. That, that, that's what was being discussed. Mm. But then Mandela and his delegation, the ANC delegation, because it was well known that they were going to take over in a few years time. The World Economic Forum invited them in Davos, right, in Switzerland. Mm. This is 1992, the New York Times covered this years back when Nelson Mandela passed away. When the ANC was there, they were continuing with the talk. This is 1992, right? They were continuing with the talk along with the investors in other countries, that this is the way we are going to do things, nationalize Marxist way of doing things. And then when they were there, apparently as they were having discussions with those people, people were like, wait a minute, guys, why do you want to pursue something that has failed us? You know, these are delegations from other countries, right? They were saying, why are you, you know, pursuing a Marxist way? Which something delegation? That will make you... These were various delegations from- Which one yes. were well, there is a mention of um, Vietnamese delegation that was there. Um, well, that's one that is only mentioned, but there were people as the mingling and all that, just having conversations with people. Um, and they were like, no, what, I mean, how do, how do you continue with this? Um, and then apparently it turns out that the documents that the NC had put together to present to investors, to, to the world, they had to change their stance, right? Because they learned at that conference that you know the way of doing the Marxist way, uh, the way to pursue Marxism in South Africa would not work. It had been a failed system, and it wasn't going to make people succeed. So that conference was quite quite critical in the sense that it made that thinking from, especially from a Nelson Mandela's perspective. That's how it's being reported. That from a Nelson Mandela perspective, that changed the way he thought. Now I don't know if you want to ask a question. Yes, yes, because I mean, this is, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I love it. I, I just love it when I'm taken back into history and all that. But uh, mm. so this is very interesting because it was a question. Um, do you think that he um, chose, that he went away from Marxist ideologies because he really believed that they, they were not good? Or is it because he actually was just being pragmatic and or being pragmatic. Look, it's not good. It hasn't worked somewhere else. And, or do you think that maybe 
he was um, still believing in Marxism, but uh, especially being in Davos, which, you know, representing the West and all of that, especially back in that, in those times, you know, the, um, was he just trying to please the West, you know, like, um, like back in the days, we know that uh, both um, Reagan and Thatcher, for example, never um, said anything about, bad about, um, you know, apartheid because they just didn't see South Africa as an ally of um, the West, you know, in the Cold War. So, so here, do you feel like Mandela was doing um, turned around because he truly believed it, or did he turn around out of pragmatism, but still not believing it, but being like, well, it seems like it works, but so let's do it. Let's be pragmatic. Or do you think he was co-telling to the West, to, you know, because supposedly maybe they, 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 they help and be apartheid. So you, what you're telling me is, it seems like he really believed that Marxism is not a good economic model. That's what well, the shift they took at the conference, right? The shift to change what they're going to present and said that this is no longer what we're going to do. It seems like this is a person who learned at the time that these things are going to work, wow. right? Wow. Um, and then there was a shift as to how the NC, the proposals, how the NC was going to rule, you know, South Africa when it came in. Now that's one, that, that, that conference was significant in the sense that it shows, it also was when you look at how, when Nelson Mandela came in in 1994, many people thought that it would be a Marxist kind of revolution in South Africa, we would see nationalizations, we would see white people in big, now yes, some white people left who were quite concerned about black rule, sure. Some, some, some did, did leave, but then there was going to be this wave, you know, of chaos and, and white people leaving. But you know, what happened was that when Nelson Mandela came in, there was a great deal. When you look at South Africa's economic performance during the Nelson Mandela administration, it did very well. We had lower, lower unemployment rates in the country compared to what we have right now. We had very much, there was a liberalization of the economy in many aspects, right? We had better, we had better economic growth in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was in charge, right? Because there were some, there were liberal kind of um, things that were significant in terms of moving South Africa forward. Mm -hmm. When it comes to agriculture, when it comes to the financial industry in South Africa. So all those sort of uh, liberal reforms did take place under Mandela. But here's what increased it though. It was welfare, you know? So we talk about free housing, you know, uh, healthcare, and so access to water, free water. Now that increased, not electricity, that kind of welfare increased. But as for Marxist nationalizations and, you know, and, and, and more severe controls in the system, that really under Nelson Mandela didn't take shape. Right, was even what's called affirmative action. It didn't come under Nelson Mandela. It came in 1999 when he had left the office. Affirmative action. It never came under Nelson Mandela's administration at the time. Really? So, yes. I mean, it was. It came under Tabumbegi. Uh, affirmative action, uh, which, which we call in South Africa, you know, Black Economic Empowerment. Um, so that came under under Big. It never came under uh, Mandela's administration. So, um, you know. Yes, Mandela, during his struggle, he was a radical Marxist, like many in the, you know, liberation fighters around the world who were really, who saw, remember Marxism was popular at the time. And also there had been an economist called uh, John Maynard Keynes, the British yeah. economist, who basically after 1930s came out and said government can intervene, you know, to achieve macroeconomic stability. Um, so, you know, those people, Economists like that, they reinforce their thinking. So there was a wave of Marxism, especially in the developing world. Mm -hmm. And Nelson Mandela in his days as, a, as an anti-apartheid you know, fighter, along with men in the NC, they believed in that idea, right? But when it came to, when we achieved democracy in 1994, the Marxist route never took shape in South Africa. We avoided wow. that. And in many African countries, that was the case. But under Nelson Mandela, that never happened. Rather, there was a liberalization of the economy. Um, there was a um, the, the purpose or the goal to achieve reconcil reconciliation. We didn't say white people must leave in South Africa. We didn't do that. We said we have to work together. Even though many of you did approve of the, you know, of the apartheid system, but we we want to have reconciliation to work together. Um, and there were no nationalizations of some sort. So I mean, so my point too is that. Uh, yes, there is, South Africa is not in, from an economic point of view, it's not in good shape, but I would argue that 
things have gotten worse just over the past 10 years. Before that, we had better economic growth, we had better employment numbers, right? Um, because there was a system that was not that much hostile to markets under Tabon Begin, as well as, um, you know, um, Nelson Mandela as well. Things got worse under the, just the previous administration of Jacob Zuma, where he basically just, just everything just went from, um, you know, to being a mess. And that right now we are poorer than what we were. And, 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 and we're gonna go into it for sure. But before, mm. move, but before moving into, you know, what happened after him and trying to figure out what he would have done different, uh, let's stay with, um, with Nelson Mandela. Uh, he's um, at the World Economic Forum. He's seeing the other leaders of some other nations that have tried the Marxist route, totally could see it failed pathetically mm -hmm. and are telling him, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Don't go that, down that way. And he's he's computing in his mind and he's saying, oh, well, I guess you're right. Um, let's go um, classical, you know, like let's be a little bit more classical liberal, I guess. Yes. What happened then? Uh, what happened with to him and um, his own friends within the party, the people who were still very much like, no, Marxism, Marxism, like what happened? Um, did, he, did he find a way to convince them or like, like how, did he, how did he manage to, to switch, to make the switch from Marxist policies to, um, you know, ec um, to more liberal, liberal economic policies back then? Well, the NC was the NC has been divided ever since. Uh, the NC is basically divided into two. You have guys who uh, who can be very rational on the economics. Who have, in fact, the current the current finance minister is a very free market guy. You know, he doesn't believe in more government. He doesn't believe in. Um, uh, he's trying even to 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 reform the welfare system. He doesn't believe in his sort of handouts. He doesn't believe in that. He has spoken publicly about it. He believes that the private sector, private sector should drive the economy. This is one of the guys who were, who were there, Makati. He, he was there during the founding of South Africa. I so there, there were guys like that. And the, one of the very popular um, uh, finance ministers in the post-1994 um, era in South Africa is Trevor Manuel. Trevor Manuel is one of the very, because he's the guy who was who served also under Nelson Mandela as well and Tabon Begging. So in the in the in the finance ministry in South Africa, so there, there had been those guys who were sensible, um, economic and understood economics, and then you would have the guys still in the same party who are more of um, you know Marxist, uh, who, 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 I mean who come from big labor unions, who, who come you know came from you know the Communist Party. So the party was had always been a bit divided. But what Mandela was smart to do in those divisions was that in his cabinet, because remember we can have a cabinet and then we are going to have members of parliament then they will represent your party, right? But in his cabinet, he really put in people largely, especially in finance and economic matters, people who were largely pro-market and understood economics, right? Yeah. Who had a classical, at least to an extent or to a larger extent, a classical liberal point of view. And that was how he managed to, to, to sort of play that card, right? To say, okay, yes, you can be Marxist or whatever, but I'm not giving you much power, you know, in the administration for you to be able to push through um, your, your, your agenda. Um, so that, I think it was Martin doing that because at the end of the day, what the NC has tried to do over the years of which right now it seems like it's, it's failing is to try and basically, in a way, play that, you know, that card of saying, well, you know, we are a party of different views. And then as soon as you look at the people who are leading the economic sort of the agenda, you are leading, sort of pushing the, the, the economics of the party. It's people like the current minister um, who was there at the time uh, in Okotongwana. These are guys who are more classical liberal, who have a classical liberal perspective. So within the NC, uh, you know, the communists in the ANC, and I've said this before, when 1994 came in South Africa, the communist sort of faction of the ANC, the communist element of the ANC, it really didn't get what it wanted, Makati, which was the communist revolution. That never happened. We didn't go down, down the road. They never, even today, they are still whining and complaining that, you know, if we can follow the Marxist route that hasn't been followed since 1994, 
because they didn't get it. Mandela didn't give them a chance to have that power, even though they were within. So he was much to play that, you know, um, uh, that card um, or to have the strategy to be able to say, you guys sit on the back bench, you know, with your ideas, they're not that good for the country. These are the people who will, who will, who will govern. And it, had, it was like that under Nelson Mandela and also largely under Thabo Mbeki as well. And then as soon as Jacob Zuma came in, communists took over in large force and the country is where it is right now trying to rebuild. So this is very, um, I'm glad we're talking about this because in a way it's, um, it's kind of setting up a record and cleaning Mandela's name because today, and tell me if you're seeing the same thing from, from being in it, but uh, today I see two types of people complaining about Mandela's legacy. People, because we look at South Africa today, and I'm going to want you to tell us what South Africa is looking like today, because I know what it's look, I know because, you know, I've been there um, recently and also less recently, so I could compare, mm -hmm. but I'm going to want you, A, to tell us what South Africa is like today, and B, based on what South Africa is like today, I see two type of people, you know, having a beef with Mandela's legacy. People like me, before I understood what you just explained, that he did not come and establish Marxist economic policies or anything like that. So people like me who believe that he came with Marxist ideologies and understand economics, we say, of course, South Africa is in the situation it's today because <laughs> Mandela must have you know, established Marxist uh, policies because he was a Marxist. Uh, and we all know that if you follow Marxist economic policies, at the end of the day, you have nothing to show for, which is where South Africa is today. So people like me, we have a beef with him because we think South Africa is doing so poorly today because, because of, you know, decades because of- Because of Nelson Mandela. Exactly, decades of Marxist policy. Oh, partly because of, by, yes, yeah, yes. Started by Nelson Mandela. So that's people like me who were misguided, who did not know what you just taught us. And, then, mm. and there are many people like that. Many, 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 many. Who yeah, especially in the West. I've seen that, my Western exactly. sort of counterparts, yeah. Exactly. And then the other faction I see is, um, you know, people, especially um, Black people who are saying, oh, you know, this whole nonsense with um, peaceful reconciliation bec between the races and, you know, ending apartheid, we were being, he was being too nice to the white people. And, uh, you know, we just need to, we just need to do it the way um, it was intended to be, right? We're gonna, mm -hmm. so, so those people are saying, we need to crack down some more. Mandela was too nice on white people and um, we need to crack down more. We need to take more, more, more. Like these guys are the ones who wanna go radical, Marxism, confiscation, mm -hmm all of that. So I'm seeing these two factions, each one of them is mad at Mandela for different reasons. And so yeah. we just we just debunked the first group. Uh, so yeah. I guess, can you tell us more? Can you um, help the second group uh, understand where maybe things went wrong? Clearly, Mandela was on the right track. Then what happened? Therefore, what needs to change? But before that, may maybe you can share with us the state of your, of your nation today. Well, the state of the nation is not good. Um, um, the unemployment rates are worse than when Mandela was in, as I just I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So unemployment is shot up. Um, government debt is worse than when Mandela was in. That's another very important measure as well. Uh, measure as well. Um, economic growth is worse than when Mandela was in. So, and that's also not good. Uh, you know, so from a economic performance, the key fundamentals, uh, we are doing much worse. Um, in fact, um, uh, when it comes to GDP per capita, um, uh, when we account for inflation, we are poorer now as South Africans compared to basically 2014 or so, compared to before, before 2014. Um, and that was during uh, this, uh, 2014 was Jacob Zuma's time in office. So things have, to, they've gone down that um, that route, um, and you know, crime rates they are very terrible, skyrocketing. The murder rate in South Africa, uh, homicide rate it's shocking. You know, uh, we are up there in the world amongst the, a few top nations. Mm -hmm. So that state is not good um, in the country. Uh, the levels of corruption as well. 
um, they are just at very shocking, uh, shocking level. Um, so that, that from an economic point of view, that is where we are. It's not good. Um, it's been getting worse, right? We also suffer from, we have a monopolized sort of um, energy sector where we have one company, a government owned company that supplies electricity. And every now and then, uh, in fact, as late as last week, we we're you know, experiencing blackouts, you know, um, almost every day lately. Um, they keep on coming back because one entity, state owned entity, entity cannot meet demand, right? Uh, so that and that has it's, it's impacted the economy. There's a huge risk with respect to our state owned, state owned company, um, ESCOM. So, that, so that's one, that perspective is, 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 is quite um, not good in South Africa. Um, from a political point of view, where we are politically, we, we uh, politics are quite stable. Um, there, is, there is a democratic process that is taking place. And when you look at this democratic process, um, though it's not perfect, but at least it shows that the ANC is continuously losing momentum and, and support. Um, in fact, in, in the recent local elections, they did, they performed, you know, worst, um, they had their most worst performance uh, since 1994 democracy came. Yeah, they got the lowest support amongst uh, voters. So the ANC is losing power over the past two decades now. The ANC has been, um, in fact, it's been on the long-term decline, uh, people sort of pulling back from, from voting for it. But the politics remain stable, um, that we are still participating. We still have active opposition parties who have ever now and then held the, um, um, the ruling party accountable for its corruption, for its mis mismanagement of the, of the country uh, from in various aspects. So the politics are stable. The institutions in South Africa, they are still there. Though of course the ruling party has um, like many liberation movements in Africa has attempted to capture, right? To seize it so that it becomes its, its um, you know, um, to seize institutions that they become their political sort of um, weapon or something. But they've struggled to do that. They've really struggled to, to capture, you know, the judiciary, you know, in other words, we have huge political influence in the judiciary. They've struggled to do that. They've also struggled, though they've attempted, I must say, during the Zuma administration, they've attempted, but they've really failed to get hold of, for example, the finance department. Also remember the finance department is critical in a nation for the nation's economy and for the people's progress because it manages the country's finances and allocates every year where will the money be spent? How much money did we collect? But Jacob Zuma tried to make that institution to be his political weapon or for it to advance his political interest but it failed, right? Partly because of a very strong sort of NGO sector um, and also strong opposition um, parties that every now and then went to the court to say the government is doing this wrong. This law is wrong. You know, these, these decisions by government are invalid. And guess what? Our judiciary would say, yes, government is wrong. You know, I don't know how many cases uh, uh, than then President Jacob Zuma was losing in court, you know, always passing laws that were invalid or against the constitution, you know, he was just losing, his government was losing again and again, you know, with them, um, with them, the judiciary that said, you know what, no, you are wrong as government. Now, if he had managed to, to, to impose his political influence um, in the judiciary, things would have turned differently, you know, into his favor, but that influence he couldn't get. The media remains very active as well. You know, in South Africa, you can criticize government, you can say many things, you can do this and this and that. Um, you know, so we, we still have that active press that is largely kind of, um, you know, at least free, though of course it's mainly, as in America, it's mainly the most dominant and mostly left wing, but it's a democracy. I'm just saying that we do have that voice to criticize the state, and speak against it. So those those fundamental issues, they I think from from that perspective, institutionally, we still have those institutions. They are still in place. Uh, and, but of course, the NC is every now and then attempting to abuse them. And so far, my argument is that 
they have um, they have failed. Mm-hmm. Interesting, and it, I'm mm-hmm. glad. I'm very. Um, I'm very. Um, um, I'm feeling much better to hear that uh, at least you know not everywhere you look is 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 is, is uh, grim, especially on the part of the freedom of the press. I'm 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 glad to hear that, and also that um, you know there's political st- at least stability. Now, whether you like what's in place or not, it's another issue. But at least there's stability. So that, that's very interesting. And one, you know, yeah, one issue I never mentioned as well, and that this seems to be ignored, um, is largely also one of the problems you face as well is what um, is the issue of uh, the family breakdown. Um, I was going to go family- into that. Yeah, I want you to hold that thought because I really yeah. want to go into that. Um, but but mm-hmm. before we go that, maybe closing up on Mandela a little bit here is, mm-hmm. if he was still here, what do you, if he came back, what do you feel like he would um, handle differently, um, you know, to the to what's going on right now? Like like, I know it's wild speculation, but I'm just uh, I just think about that man a lot. And so, what um, what do you feel like he would he would do differently today? Would he would he keep the ANC? Would he completely ditch them and say you guys are? It's just at this point, it's the point of no return. Like, what do you think would happen? You know. <laughs> The NC, the NC was the party that he grew up in. It's the party that he 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 served throughout his life. It's the party that was a vehicle, right, to counter the very oppressive system that jailed him for 27 years, almost three decades, staying in jail. And to me, I think that was the most painful thing, the highest price he paid for South Africans to spend 30 years in jail. That was painful. You know, I sometimes imagine it. I'm saying, how could this person come out of jail where he had been, you know, locked up for 30 30 years and then come out and say, let's reconcile, you know, let's move forward. He would, Mandela would say, please, guys, we have to move forward. Anything will result in, in blood flowing across the country. You know, we will have a conflict of a huge magnitude in the country. How does someone like that come out and, and, and seek reconciliation and, 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 you know, and, and, um, you know, to forgive? To me, I think that was, that was very significant. Um, and all that he did build within the NC. Uh, so to answer our question, to get straight to your question as to what he would do, my view is that given how attached he is to the NC, I think he would have at this point to seek and reform it within, right? To say, guys, get rid of the corrupt guys. Let's do this thing. We have served the people. I mean, appoint people in the government who are going to serve the interests of the people and who understand the economy, how the economy works. The guys who will understand that we need the country to achieve stronger economic growth, right? And that having business is key. Having a market economy is very important. That's, I think he would seek to reform the NC within because of the, the attachment he has in the party to reject and abandon it. I doubt that, would, that he, would, he, he would do that. Um, so, and there are leaders right now. Talon Beg is trying to do that at this point. He's traveling, traveling around the country um, trying to, you know, tell people that, in fact, going to NC conferences and telling his NC, NC members that you guys have become corrupt, you are abusing the system, we have to change, people no longer like you, your, your support is declining, you have to reform, that's what he's going around doing. Um, and I suspect he would have been that kind of a person then to reject it and move, then, and move elsewhere, he would seek to reform it within to bring better leaders uh, so that the party can, you know, can serve the interests of, of the people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, and um, do you have uh, any hope? I mean, do you feel like it's going to get worse before it gets better? Do you, are you seeing, um, are you seeing something that gives you uh, reasons to believe that uh, maybe uh, change is on the way at all? Well, it's all, this. Um, I have written in one of my columns um, in local um, uh, news platform that I think the worst is still coming. Uh, we'll need to hit a serious pothole before we can recover. 
reason being it all really relies hinges on them the political sort of um you know flow of things over the next decade or so uh because there are two scenarios in the next national elections which will be in 2024 it will be, it will be that the nc hits below 50 percent uh going into a coalition um with um either a very much lean, uh, you know marxist leninist um uh, political party and that is the economic freedom fighters and that would mean that because the the, the economic freedom fighters has already pressured the nc over the past decade or so to move and more to move more and more to the left um the beginning of the jacob zuma so if, they, if these guys were to get into a coalition then we are straight going into marxism of nationalizations and all sort the economic freedom fighters has been has said things that are very offensive including attacks on you know the white minority and so on and so on violent the violent tactics they have they're just a violent organization that believes I, in marxism I, radical marxism um so if if, if that coalition market if that coalition takes place and there's a chance that it does then we are going to hit the bottom it will be painful for south africa um and then another uh, uh possibility is that we could see the second um sorry the, the major ruling party this democratic alliance which is more of a liberal party uh, and liberal and do not mean it in the sense of the american the american sense i'm talking about the classical liberal, classical liberal. you know yeah yeah which is it's, it, it believes in, in business um it's sort of um you know it doesn't believe in racial uh, policy or affirmative action mm. so the one possibility is that the nc if it does lose the vote i could go into a coalition with that democratic alliance which is more of a classical liberal party um and that would in fact the leader of the democratic alliance has over the past i think last year he said he would be open um, to work with, there is a possibility that he could work with the current president of the NC, Sir Ramaphosa, you know, because he sees him as a bit of a least bad guy in the NC, more of a guy, guy who believes in the constitution, more of a reformer, that there would be, you know, they could consider working with him. And, and partly he says that partly because they would be wanting to avoid, um, because if they, if they let, if they let the, the, the these radical Marxist guys to, to, to go into a coalition with the ANC, then the country will be totally destroyed. So part of them, their plan would be to say, okay, to avoid this scenario, let's rather go into the coalition with them with the ANC. So at least we avoid that radical Marxism that will, you know, you know, impose a serious, serious damage in the country. So those are two things that, that, that could happen in 2024. And of course, there are other scenarios, we shall see how it goes, but those are the two that have been in my mind. Um, and I have been, in fact, I have been thinking that um, uh, my, my opinion has been that the classical liberal party, the Demo Democratic Alliance would not go into a coalition with them, with the ANC and therefore basically it should be a coalition between the NC and the EFF, which means that definitely now we are going into what Mandela tried and avoid, which is radical Marxism uh, in the country. Um, so, uh, you know, my view is that, and also another thing is that if Suram Apostol leaves right now, the guy who it seems who is currently the deputy president of the country, if he comes in, he would really be himself, he's been accused of corruption, he himself really doesn't believe in them, in really the the, the you know uh, the market as as key to to prosperity. So again, if the ANC continues to be in power, we are going to we are going to hit through the pothole. So my gut feeling is that we, things will get uh, worse um, so long as the ANC is in power. That we need the ANC completely lose power to get things back on track with the ruling party, and of course they will need to be replaced by the people who believe in classical liberal, you know, um, system, yeah. uh, for us to get back on, no, on track. Yeah, I find it very, uh, I find it funny, ironic, and it kind of pisses me off that um, those Marxists are calling themselves the economic freedom um, and uh, and fighters. Fighters, like, economic freedom you know, fighters. Can you believe? Yeah, that? economic freedom yeah. fighters. I'm like, you're not about economic freedom. You're about economic slavery, right? Slavery, so yeah. it's just, it just, it just kind of interesting they, they would call themselves like that but typical Marxist. and they have they have a good appeal amongst young people. i know 
I know. I know. I know. I know. It's, it's they just. Were, they were founded in 2014 and they have doubled their support in the previous elections. They've done very well that they've doubled their support over the past, you know, over the past years. Um, and the young people, they like you see their, their membership. It's young people who believe in this thing. See. What do you think? That, so, what, what do you think is interesting them about it? Is it's about the word freedom in there, or is it they're being promised tons of um, tons of free stuff? What is it? It's tons of free stuff, free education. You know, we are not going to pay any tuition fees. Um, free this, free that. You know, um, we are going to take land from white people and give it to you. You are poor because you don't have land. You know, the system is racist. White people are in charge. They're in charge of banks. They're in charge of mining industries. They're in charge of tourism and so on. You know, we as the economic freedom fighters, we are going to take all of that from them and give it to you. In fact, they've, they've already started Makata with land grabs that are illegal. They go around and mobilize people to grab people's lands. Illegal activities taking place, right? Wow. And these are wow. all young people. So for them to young people, that sounds appealing. You know, these guys are going to bring us everything we want and therefore they, they fall into it. Um, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's, um, it's said in, the, in that aspect that young people are sort of, that they really believe in that, um, that many young people, I wouldn't say the majority, but the membership of this party, membership, membership of this party is very much young people. Do you know what, what saddens me the most about hearing this? is that for me, people who believe that somehow, if only I am Magad, and if only I take from Fumlani, um, from him a little bit, can I be myself better off? Because when you're doing that, when you think that way, you're telling me right away that you actually don't believe in yourself. You're in a way accepting that Fumlani somehow must be better and superior to you. And that the only mm -hmm. way that you can have something similar is by taking a little bit of what he has accomplished. So for me to have young Africans being in this mindset of the only way for me to get something is if I get it for free, as if you can't make anything happen for yourself. The fact that they have abandoned any type of, of pride in providing for themselves is just to me sad. And that's normally not what young people are supposed to be. The young people are the ones who are supposed to believe in themselves, believe in the future and say, I don't need your crap. Yes. I'm gonna do my own, thank you very much. Yes. So this is so mm. sad to me. It means that we, we don't, they don't believe, I mean, anyway. So, so I guess, um, yeah, take us into this whole issue about the family, you know, structure. Breakdown, uh, structure. Mm. Breakdown. I feel like South Africa, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's one of the only countries in Africa, at least in black Africa, we could say that Af South Africa maybe is, is more mixed than the rest of sub-Saharan African nations, but it's not really something, even if people are getting more divorced than usual, um, the sanctity of the family is still very prevalent in most African nations and cultures. So this is, I think this is the, the first body of, um, you know, anywhere in, con in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that I can think of where, I mean, when, every day when I see you writing about the breakdown of the family structure in South Africa, and uh, especially among black people, black Africans, I am shocked because I, I, I don't think it's happening in other African nations, or at least not this bad, this fast. I felt like that's something that we always had. So, so what's going on here? It seems like from that standpoint, you guys are so close to what's happening in, in um, African American communities here in America. So, so what's going on? What happened? I mean, when did um, it start to, to be this way? Because that was, you taught me this. I, I, I did hmm. not know that. I did not see that. You're the one, it's by following you, but I started to to catch, to, to kind of take wind of to it. be aware of this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you know, I mean, uh, the statistics are exactly the same as America's, which is quite interesting. And when I look at this, it's quite funny. It was at least 77, uh, sorry, at least 70% um, of, um, of, of young kids in the black um, community in South Africa 
they don't live with their fathers, at least 70%. And that's about the same number as the US. The US yes. is about the same number in, yes. the, in, the, in, the, in the black community. Um, and compare that to Indians, uh, whites, um, who are really right at the top. More than 80% of their, of their kids are in sort of in families. They grow up there. I think you and I, and I, I, and, and I hope the audience does understand uh, the fact that without a strong sort of family unit uh, in the country, really achieving much prosperity or a great deal of prosperity or moving forward or achieving speedy economic development would be very difficult. It's not an easy thing to do. The yeah. research is quite clear that you would need to have a, you know, that a, a child growing up in a um, in the presence of mom and dad, that yeah. child is likely has a very high chance of su succeeding in life than the child who is not exposed to that, whose father is not there, you know. So the, the global research is quite clear on that. Yeah. And South Africa is... Yeah, yeah, and South Africa's, South Africa's statistics amongst uh, us black people, they are very disturbing. Now, there's a counter. When I raise that in South Africa's media platform, social media platforms, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, or whether I'm on radio and so on and so on, there's a counter to my arguments where people say, well, but Pumlani, we have the apartheid system where people were basically had to migrate live from, um, you know, they call it migrant, la uh, migrant labor, right? Where people would leave homes, or the men, I should say, men would leave homes back home and go and work in the rural areas. You leave your, 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 your wife, then your kid, you go and work in, you know, in Jobbik, leaving your kids behind, right? And therefore, that is, that is why we have this, you know, um, you know kids amongst, uh, amongst black people, they don't live with their fathers. Now, it's hard to believe that because that was back then. In this day and age, for example, in 2017, Makata, in 2017, um, there was research that was released and it showed that in that year, 60% um, of the kids were born in that year and born by parents who were less than 35 years old, which means that really they never lived under apartheid. <laughs> yeah. Those 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 um, yeah. those parents, these yeah. young people giving birth, Guess what? At least sixty-seven. Sorry, at least sixty percent of their kids who were born at the time, there were there was no information about their fathers. Uh, but, I mean, there was no information about their fathers as to where they are. These are people who never lived under under the apartheid system, right? And this issue of migrant labor is is it was among it was among it's a small sector. People refer to mining. Was mining people would leave the Eastern Cape or the, 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 the east coast of South Africa to come and work at the mines in Jobek, right? Because that's where the minings were in Houting. Um, But I mean, it was a small portion of the, of, of the black population that did that. Many people never worked in mines. People, black people stayed in what was called during the, during the apartheid system, homelands, right? Because there was segregation. The apartheid system had something called homelands, right? And people stayed there. Um, and not all of them, they came in large numbers to, to, to come and work at the, at the mines. Not everyone was employed them. People lived next to towns, right? And ne next to towns in townships, which are just small areas next to towns. I grew up like that. You take a text from a township, which is, you know, um, you take a text from them, which can be what, uh, $1 or so, you know, and then you take a text from them and then you get to work in the morning, then you come back home you know, in the evening, right? Um, and many people lived around, and so there's no need to leave your child. My dad, when I was growing up, my dad was like that. He stayed in a township and he would go to work every morning and then come back in the evening, right? To a city, because the cities are nearby. And many people, most people, they are living like that in South Africa. So there's no need to blame this market system where people, they leave their homes and say, no, we are I'm leaving home you know, I'm going to work there. I'm therefore leaving my child and mother behind. Their system has disappeared, especially amongst these young people now. It's no longer there, these young mothers who are less than 40, less than, you know, um, less, than, less than 35. It was there even during my, my, grand, my grandfather who died way back in 1992. And of course, he, he would be in his 90s now if he were alive. That was old back then. 
But even then, he wasn't in the majority who were to experience that 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 migrant labor in the sense that he was really he would come home in Guazunatal once a month because he worked in Jobek. Um, and um, you know, a, a drive from Jobek to where back at home is about basically five hours or so. Right. So it's a distance. Um, so that was back then. But that to, to use migrant labor as an excuse, I think for me is irresponsible. There are fundamental problems that we have to understand that um, that we need to, you know, to accept um, and embrace so that we can find a solution, right? There is a tendency, at least even by observation, of tendency of we as Black men going around, you know, the tendency just to, to have kids with multiple women. That's very much prevalent. Uh, or to have a kid without getting married, especially in my, when I look at my peers and, and, and just people I know, you can see that there is this culture that we just like having kids without having commitment to a marriage and so on and so on. Now, the moment you talk about that, people say, well, we are getting personal. We're just being a conservative, conservative, and they dismiss you. No, but it's not about that. It's about the impact, the socioeconomic impact this has in our society, because that contributes to the, these widening sort of, you know, racial, racial inequalities in the country that are currently being debated. It's interesting what you're saying and going back to the parallels you were building with um, the situation of um, in America in, um, in um, you know, like um, in, in, um, African, in the African-American community. Here I belong more to an African immigrant community because that's how they would look at us. And now we even have this whole thing about, anyway, let me not go into this conversation, a whole other one, but uh, you were building some, um, some um, parallels and even there I feel like it's the same thing because it, black people in this country right um, you know right um, during the segregation times their numbers you know, you know the, the, the amount of children who were being born in wedlock were so much higher and things started going down it seems like with a more progressive um, um, ideas came about and it's not so much about the ideas. I feel like uh, maybe it's with the coming of um, the welfare system where we basically just are saying, it's almost like we don't need the favor, right? And uh, you get the more, the less the favor is in the child's life and the more help you are gonna get. So, I, 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 and it's funny that you were talking about also for you, um, if you talk about family thing, we consider you to be a conservative, but I don't understand why this should ever have had to do We've been with politics or ideology. Yeah we've, yeah, we've been conservative, we've been progressist. At the end of the day, whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not, just like the simple truth that in order to breathe, I have taken, you know, um, oxygen and I and I release and I release out CO2, you know, dioxide carbon. That very simple fact, whether I like it or not, it is what it is. I mean, it's what so, it is. The same, data shows yeah, this. What an yeah, opinion. Same thing, exactly. Same thing with a family thing. So I know that uh, especially progressists would love it to be to be different, but it is not. And the reality is a BITCH, that's just the way it is. And so for me, knowing how important this is, uh, this, these concepts are to whether or not we're gonna have children who get all the chances in life or not, we should really, I, we should find a way not to make this about politics anymore. It's a, at this point, yeah. it, should, it shouldn't matter. It's like, what works? If we know what works, can we help people be more within that frame unless they're really saying i don't want that if they don't want that that's fine but this idea of of, of lying and almost telling people oh look you're a human being you need air you need oxygen to breathe and you release co2 out but i get it you maybe you you feel like you sh it should be more like you living like a fish i'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on water forever i mean good luck with that and i feel like that's kind of what's going on and and i just don't know i'm just um i'm surprised it's happening there so so what um are you so I feel like you're being fought every day because I can see on Twitter, like people <laughs> getting on your case. So are you seeing a subset of folks hearing you out? I mean, are you, is it, is your message making progress or right now they're just busy beating, beating on your head and you're just tired or what's going on? Um, <laughs> Sorry. I think the people I have bumped into a few people, uh, who say to me, you know, I get what you're saying. Um, 
um, you know, I mean, you are very brave. You are not telling what you should be, what people should be telling. Um, and some would say, even though I do disagree to an extent, but I commend you for, for your bravery, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just not long time ago, I was in a bar and, and this guy, um, he says to me, hey, I saw you on TV. You were debating this other researcher on national TV. He says, I mean, I saw you, hey, hey dude, you know, I mean, yeah, I, sh I never agreed with you, you know, uh, but brah, you know, you know what I think? I think, I mean, I commend you for what you stand for, you know. <laughs> I'm like, hey, man, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> I have to stand for what I believe in. <laughs> and also trying to shape, you know, people's uh, people's thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but your, your, your question is, am I being hurt? Um, I think people are watching. Um, people, they, they, it's, it's hard for them to take on the truth, to accept the truth. I do have some radicals who are mainly from the economic freedom fighters, the supporters, of course, who says, course. well, you have been, you are, you are a sellout to black people, you are this Uncle Tom, you are this and that coconut and all that stuff. <laughs> How are you being a sellout to black people? Who is a sellout to black people? The person who promotes ideologies and thoughts and behavior that's gonna actually get black people in trouble or the people who are advocating ideologies, thoughts and behavior that's actually gonna maximize their chances of um, mm. not only surviving, but also thriving in life. Who, mm. who is the traitor? Should we be looking at it that way? Or is it mm. once again about what some people, like because all of these communists, African, African Marxists, are nothing else but the puppets of the left, of the West, if you ask me. African Marxists, they love to call, they love to say to say to any African who is non-Marxist that we are the ones who embrace the, um, the ways of the West, but then I say no. The hmm. ways of a Marxist is the way of a colonial, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a foreign concept to real true Africans, um, and for that you have to go back to pre-colonial Africans. So being a Marxist yes. is really not who we are. And so- it was brought by colonialists, brought exactly. Marxism in the country. Ex so exactly. how do you make it more, in South Africa, it's seen as pro-black, that if you're a Marxist, you understand the needs of black people, you're no, advancing the, no, the interests no, no. of I'm gonna, people. I'm gonna go ahead and say it right, way, right now, African Marxists are the puppets of um, mm. Westerners and chief of them, mm. um, Marx. A yes, <laughs> the German, yes. the white a man. A white man. You are you are, you are peddling all over the continent the ideas of some very very misguided white man who didn't even understand who you are, know where you come from, could probably mm. care less about you as a black person. Mm. You're peddling his stupid ideas that have caused that are among the ideas that have caused the most trouble in the world. You know. Um, Generation after generation, you black African are so proud to be peddling these stupid ideas. Um, and every time you're doing that, you are actually turning further away from the teachings of your forefathers, your African black yes, forefathers. Of your origins. Your colonial Africans. Yeah. yeah. So hmm. for me, this is a schizophrenia that I'm, I'm just not understanding. I'm just like, what happened to us? I mean, the, so we need um, almost like a, a continent wide, you know. Um, I don't know, just like uh, retraining. I don't know how you want to call this, but um, this lack of understanding of our history is just here to still bite us. And this attachment that we have to this, to this crazy white man, bearded, crazy German white man and these stupid ideas that have Marxist never been ideas, anywhere. Yeah. Yes, these Marxist ideas. I just mm. don't understand why we're so enamored with this crap, right? It's mm. just, I, I don't know. Do you? Well, politicians, what else? For politicians, if they are coming to say we are going to get things free for you, you know, politicians also have a very much big, I know we have to blame them to a very big extent as well, because the way for them to campaign is that we are going to give you things for free. We are going to make sure that there's government interventions in the economy so that you can get a fair share and so on and demonize other people. Um, initiate or start class wars and all this stuff. Politicians very much have a role to play in this. And also these politicians, they can also brainwash, you know, people um, to say that actually, well, you know, this is the right way of doing things. 
you know, and look at history from a Marxist perspective because Marxism benefits them. Remember, classical liberalism means that I'm going to give you, Magata, the freedom to decide about your life. Yeah. Now, is there a politician in Africa who wants to do that? They all want to come and say, well, you know what? I will do things for you in this way. I know what's best for you. You don't know what's yeah. best for yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, so the, 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 the politics, the nature of politics itself, when politicians come and want to promise people so that they can hold on to power and rule forever, you know, and basically make people be dependent on government. Um, you know, that, that, that system itself, especially in Africa, is what is also letting down. And of course, the fact that our people, they are also misinformed on the history of what really has worked and what has destroyed nations. They Absolutely. have, they, they are misinformed, they have the wrong knowledge. And these politicians, they continue for political power, so, so that they hold on to political power, they continue spreading that, you know, that, that fake stuff, you know, or misinformation. So it's a, it's a, it's a sad state for, for the continent. Um, and I feel that to go back to your question, whether I'm being heard or not, um, I'm beginning to think that I'm being heard. Now, that's what I'm beginning to think now. I'm, I'm also tracking my following on Twitter. Um, okay. I've noticed that it's been, initially it was largely very much um, white people um yeah. were very much not really i would say i would see sort of a, a strong engagement and, and, and growth there in my following when it, it was very much white people but then over the past two years now black people more and more have been following and following and following that's um very encouraging yes uh but here's what i'm noting though many of them they don't they will read and don't engage right because some of this things they are hard to swallow but it's okay. Um, it's okay. There, I think. It's okay. Um, I think it's commendable. As Liz was showing up, they're listening. Um, mm. That's all you can do. Plenty seeds. Yes. All I do is to try and talk about the fundamental, fundamental problems that are on the ground we are facing. There are no jobs. Right. Some of them probably yeah. never heard about it. That's the other yeah. thing, because especially in insofar as you were saying that your media is also more, the mainstream media is more or less progressive. That's why I don't use the word liberal anymore, because I feel like even that word has been hijacked by, at least in America, left, yeah. in, in, mm. in America, liberal in is America, everything yeah. but, but free or, or liberal. So let's just call them, let's just call it progressives for now, um, you know, for the sake of being progressive. So what I mean by that is, um, I feel like now it's no longer about being a progressist for the sake of making things better or in, in the name of progress, of good of progress as it relates to good progress, but it's more about this attachment to, to progressive, you know, like no matter what, it's like it, it needs to keep moving forward, even if, it, even if moving forward means destroying. That's, that's why... I'm, I'm calling it more like pro progressives, you know, this, mm, mm. this progressive movement for the sake of progressivism, progressivism, the, the human, the human destructive program. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Progression. Like, yeah. Yeah. I feel like the, I feel like the human thriving and human flourishing, which in a way was at the root of progressives of, of a progressist, I believe way back when I think has evolved into being a progressist, for the sake of being a for the sake of progressivism, even if it means, wait, if you keep moving down this path, you're going to destroy now. But they're like, no, we could, I gotta keep moving. We cannot stop. We cannot go backwards. We cannot go well, upwards. Well, so progressive. Yeah. yeah, we cannot go up, up, up. We have to keep moving because that's what being a progressive means. Keep going forward, even mm. if you destroy everything in the on the way. Um, so that's I find it so like robotic thinking, and it's just whatever so um yeah. here i feel that uh it is important probably to hear your voice because the mainstream media which is hijacked by progressives for the sake of progressists progressism mm. progressivism are not inclined to share these um any piece of information that doesn't um that doesn't um that seems like it's stuck in time this concept of a family structure for them it's something that's stuck in time but i'm like mm. again whether you like it or not it is it, it it it's the best chance a child has um now of course people are going to get divorced of course people shouldn't stay in toxic relationships of course women shouldn't be staying in relationships where they're being beaten up by some bad guys of course we get all of that but um it still doesn't change the fact that ideally ideally 
children, and I think we see it everywhere, children love having their parents. And uh, it's not because it cannot be, it cannot happen sometimes that it shouldn't happen, but you know, to just trample that idea of a family just because we think family structure as we know no. it is not progress, progressing, uh, then therefore let's kill it. I think it's just ridiculous because then you're not telling, you're telling me you don't care. About, it's not about the people that you care about. You just care about an ideology of moving forward. So in any case, no. um, all of this just to say that I commend you for your work because you are bringing because I bet you so many people are wondering why is, what's going on here? Okay, surely, surely uh, some of these, you know, like um, surely uh, politics or economics has, you know, is part of this, but surely there's something else going on. And also, so I love mm -hmm. that you're, you're bringing this, uh, this like, did you, oh, did you ever, did you think about this? You know, and then people don't have to agree with you, but at least I think it's important to, to bring them some, some other explanation to what might be happening to them. Yes, really to why we have why we exactly. have racial inequality in South Africa. Why do we have white people earning way more than blacks? Exactly. With the oh economic explanations behind that, including yeah. the family breakdown. And also behavioral, yes. because if you're not going to- Behavioral as well. Exactly. And, and at some point we have to be honest with ourselves. And this is why I get so mad about us black people. We, we, we don't give ourselves the license to be real about our, our shortcomings and also about mm. our strength. We're very good about touting our strengths. We're very good about it. But oftentimes I find us to be, it's almost like it's taboo to talk about the things we don't do right, right? And, um, and then, but I'm like, if you really wanna make progress in life, it doesn't matter who you are, everything starts with um, an acceptance of this, these are my mm. pluses, these are my minuses, and I'm going to work on my minuses. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to be better, but we don't allow ourselves to go there. And I think it's because maybe we're just like, oh, anytime I recognize something negative about myself, I'm giving them one, and them is the white people, and them is the you know all these people who have sat there and said, oh, you guys are stupid, you guys are inferior, you guys are lazy, you guys all you do is just pop kids all over the place. We don't want to give them one more ammunition, you know, to criticize yes. us. Right, mm -hmm. but but right now we should remember it should not be about them. And I try to say this, even for me when I mentor people, I try to have them forget what other people think. It doesn't matter. But in order for matter. you, to become, in order for you mm -hmm. to become better, you have to be honest with where you're at, what you're doing good and what you're not doing good, and keep and and keep improving. Don't don't worry if they laugh at you. If they say, "Oh, I told you so," or if they say, "Oh, yeah, I yeah, but I'm, I'm not surprised." Who cares? And no one will stop you on your way to success. If you exactly. work, commit, plan, and make the right decisions, nobody Absolutely. will stop you. Exactly. No white person will stop nothing. you. Nothing, nothing. No racist will no. stop you. And, and if you are Exactly. Yeah. And this is the message we're not telling them. So that's why I, I commend you. I want you to keep to, uh, that's why, you know, we wanted to have you on because your voice is so important in my mind. And I feel like also it would be good to have you in the US to come and talk about, you know, what you're also mm -hmm. observing on the family structure being being taken down, you know, by the same forces um, and it's affecting the same people once again. Same people once again. The same, the, 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 the again. same people that you have, they're having the same problem. Yep. It's the same problem it's, this it's time. Us. Everywhere you look, and so, so you need to keep doing what you're doing. I commend you. I know it's hard because I know um, how most people tend to think about it. And then, so you're fighting two groups. You know, one group of um, um, African people who are like, Come, "Stop saying this stuff," you know, from Lenny, because whenever, whenever you recognize, whenever you're saying this stuff, you're giving them more ammo to 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 criticize us. And mm -hmm. the others are like, "Oh, you just um, you're just an Uncle Sam. You're just like a you know Uncle like, Tom." <laughs> Uncle Tom or a Bunti, you know, like, I don't know for you guys, but us in French Africa, we have, uh, in Francophone Africa, we have this, uh, we have this, um, it's like a chocolate bar and it's called Bunti, B-O-U-N-T-Y, back in the days. So mm. it's inside, it's like um, coconut, so white coconut, you know, paste and uh, covered with uh, chocolate. So they would call us, oh yeah, you guys are Bunti's because, you know, you're black from the outside, but, um, but inside you're white. Inside you are kind white. Of nonsense. And, and why do they call you that way? Because you are believing and promoting a behavior that somehow in the most twisted, sick, um, and uh, wicked way, they were sold to be the behavior of a white people. When our ancestors believed in marriage, 
Yes, believed in family. It was a disgrace for a child to I mean, without marriage. When disgraceful. did that, yeah, so when did that become white? To believe in family structure and, fa and fa you know what I mean? You can tell me if it's conservative if you want to, but for you to turn around and say it's white, I'm like. It's not a white thing. We don't, we just have to take, learn to take responsibility as Africans and stop, you know, blaming other people. We have to look in the mirror. It is us who have to change this continent for the better. Yeah, it is, it is really mm. that. And uh, as long as we, and I feel like um, it's sad for me because I'm like, the problem is you are focused. You are obsessed with white people. And that's the problem. You're obsessed with white people. You're more obsessed with your desire to crush white people down than your so-called own um, desire to rise yourself up to the top. And so I am really questioning people. What mm. is most important? And let's be real here, because once you tell me your truth, maybe it makes everything, then things can be, you know, you have to think what is most important. And the African Black people listening to us, whether they're Africans or living somewhere in America, so African-Americans or being Brazilian Africans, I don't know where you are and whatever, but if you're, this kind of yours is black, you know, and you're listening to us, I have a real, I, I have a question for, for you. Mm -hmm. I want to know what is it that matters the most and be honest with yourself. Think about this question and mm -hmm. really try to answer it yourself. You don't have to get back to us, but think about it between these two, which one is the most important? They don't tell me all oh, equally. Tell me which one. Is it more important for you to crush the white man, the white people, even if it means you stay miserable yourself? Or are you here to rise yourself to the beautiful, shining, co-creator, innovator, most respected mm. person that can be in the world? What do you care the most about? The first one where you just mm -hmm. want to destroy white people for the sake of destroying them, even if it means you stay in the mud with them, or you're interested in being at the top of your game, even mm -hmm. if it means white people can thrive right there along with you. Mm -hmm. It's one of those two, which one is most important? I think it's just important for you to know, because if your answer is the first one, then I'm here to tell you, good luck. Good luck and enjoy misery because that's pretty much where you're gonna stay. But if you, if you answer the next one, they better then start listening to people like you. Mm. Like from Nanny, like yes. people like me, because that's where, yeah. that's where your salvation is. And that's where you're gonna get all the things that you want. And so I just think it's important we ask ourselves that question because oftentimes I can feel the hate and um, I'm not gonna sit here and talk about you know, is this justified, not justified, or how did it come about, or try to psychoanalyze that whole thing. That's really not my time, not my place. I'm interested in how do we move forward. And yes. so I think we have to ask ourselves, each one of us has to ask ourselves that question. Is it about revenge and getting back at, even if it means we stay in the crap? Or is it about manifesting our greatest potential? Yes, developing ourselves. Yeah. Right? Right? That's key. You mm. have to be clear about that. And because once you're clear, the path also becomes very clear. Yes. And then you decide who are going to be your, com your fellow companions of the road, your fellow travel, mm. you know, travel companions. And one of them is going to be very clear. You're going to see people like, they're going to see people like you from Lenny, like me mm. on the road, you know, and it's a joyous journey. It's a joyous journey. Yes, progressing yeah. in life. It's, it's actually a, 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 a journey of progress for real. Yes. Right and lot Not of stagnation, stagnation, no, things no, stalling because no, you are fixated no. exactly. on white people. Exactly. So quit your fixation on white people. They they really have they don't even they don't even have any time for you, by the by the way. So you doing this, you're only ruining yourself. But that's it. Mm -hmm. So at some point we've got to find we gotta we gotta move forward. And so anyway, I'm so glad that uh, you're traveling on this road with us. Um from mm. Lani, I'm so happy to be uh, your fellow sister and your fellow traveler of the of 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 road and um, keep, keep doing what you're doing. Um, 
Is there anything that you have coming up that you want to announce to people or uh, do you want to tell us um, where we can find, you know, your work and be in contact with you? We're going to put everything in the contact information, but if, there, if there's anything that's coming up or you want to bring our attention to. I don't have anything major coming up <laughs> for the public, uh, but I mean, where you can find me is basically, I'm on Twitter as well. You and I follow each other. I'm at my handle is at Kumlani M. Machozi. That's my handle. I'm also on Facebook as well. Um, that's where you we will find me. I'm also, um, I do have a website where I just put all my content, you know, if something has been on the news platform, I also upload it after it's been published on my website. So I have it kept that was, you don't know what the platform could do with it. Two years later, they might say, well, we should have not published this article, just take it down, you know? So that's why I also keep it in, on, you know, on my website. Um, so it's my website is just pumlanimachos.com. Yeah, so that's where I am. So those are the, the, the platforms where you, you, you can find me. And of course, if anything comes up in the, in the near future, I, I usually, uh, I post there as well. So yeah, Very it's been great, great to talk to you and uh, it was an exciting conversation and I hope people will, will hear us, especially our African uh, brothers and sisters. For sure. Thank you so much, Kumlani. Keep up the good work. I appreciate you so dearly and um, anytime and I look forward to having you back on here, okay? Wonderful, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. This episode supports the upcoming release of my book, The Heart of a Cheetah, The Truth About African Poverty and the Future of Human Flourishing. Make sure to subscribe to my show on YouTube and Spotify and follow me on Twitter. Learn more at magatwade.com.